Hi everyone, welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Michelle Lee. Michelle is a news anchor for NBC affiliate King TV in Seattle. She is a morning show anchor and co-created and hosted the show Take 5, a daily hour-long interactive news show before it sunset in 2019. Previously, Michelle worked as a primary evening anchor for legacy stations in Wisconsin, the coastal Carolinas, and southwest Missouri. Michelle has been recognized for leading innovation and audience engagement projects in newsrooms. Google, Pointer, Facebook, and RTDNA have showcased her work in newsrooms across the country. She has received four National Mural Awards and nine regional Emmys. Congress also honored her with an Angels in Adoption Award for her dedication to international and domestic adoption causes. As a Korean adoptee, Michelle spent many summers volunteering with adoptive families and in orphanages in Seoul. She launched a television program in Missouri to help foster kids find more permanent solutions and spoke at the National Press Club for International Adoption Awareness. Michelle grew up in a rural area near Kansas City and studied journalism at the University of Kansas. Her hobbies are mostly cooking and volunteering, and she loves being a homebody with her husband Jim and their son. Jim is an Emmy award-winning photographer who now works as a software engineer for a news corporation. For fun, Michelle once played a reporter in the movie Tammy and on the TV show The Following. Michelle, welcome to the show. Michelle, we're so excited to have you on the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. We've been following along your journey. I think that we were since almost like day one, right? I think we we're one of the first ones to like pick up on the news. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll dive into that later. Uh, okay. Michelle, Michelle, tell us about yourself. Like, what was your upbringing like? What was your childhood like? Oh my like? gosh. Wow. Well, how much time do we have, Brian? Seriously? Yeah, well, you it's, have all uh... the time you need. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like my, you know, I feel like my childhood was really unique. And at the same time, when you talk to a lot of transracial adoptees, it's very similar to an adoptee experience. Um, I grew up with white parents in rural Missouri, and um, I joked that I was the only Asian kid in my county. Uh, so it was very strange to want to explore anything that was Asian because no one around me was Asian. No one around me was Korean. Um, you know, everyone used to always call me Chinese, you know, or Japanese, um, which is, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who've had that experience, but. I think um, for me, in many ways, my childhood was beautiful and idyllic. Like we you know, literally jumped on hay bales and played with farm animals, you know, like it was, we were outside all the time. It was actually pretty cool. And in, in the, in high school, you know, we do bonfires. I mean, it was, it was really neat in many ways. Um, but then when it came to, I think, race and diversity, it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, you know, most people, would say, oh, Michelle, we just saw you with you, <laughs> which we know what that means, you know. Um, you know, people would say, I don't, I didn't see your race, you know, but of course that's not helpful. Um, I will say when I was a teenager, that's when I started really going to Korean heritage camps. Um, and those are for adoptees. And you learn a lot about Korea. You learn a lot about um, like food, culture, songs, all those things. And then when I was 18, I went to Korea for the first time, met my biological family that's still intact, and then um, went back to Korea probably like every two or three years since then. And then that stopped when I got married because my birth family started coming to the United States. So that's wow. in, in a nutshell, that's me. <laughs> wow. I mean, that in, in itself is so powerful already, right? And for me, I am personally still learning a lot about the, the adoptee community and what the adoptee community goes through and what the adoptee's challenges are, right? Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot of that because a couple of my team members in Asian Hustle Network were adoptees. Oh, and really? Yeah. So we tried to do, create a lot more inclusive programs around that and talk about the healing process, the trauma, and, and you know, that's I feel like with the adoptee community, it's sort of overlooked in a lot, in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Because it's like, as we know, the Asian diaspora is, is massive already. And now there's different nuances of the Asian mm -hmm. diaspora. And like, I feel like the adoptee community is like one of the nuances that are often over, over time overlooked, right? Yeah, and, and I find myself even, um, it's weird because when you think of like things that are Asian, like if you're trying to make a logo or you're trying to, you know, uh, make a symbol that represents 
us. <laughs> you know, you think about things and it's like, well, none of them really were related to my upbringing, you know? And so I don't want to leave out um, the whole idea about very Asian is being inclusive, you know? And so um, it's really hard sometimes to think about like, okay, what does culture mean to us? Because yeah. we every, and actually this is a lot of, I think, Asian folks, um, Asian Americans, is that we in many ways have to be very intentional about the culture that we bring into our lives because maybe we're not getting it from our parents or our families. And that could be because you're an adoptee or not because you're an adoptee. And, um, but I definitely think there was an imposter syndrome that I had to deal with for many years, thinking that I was not Asian enough to ever vocalize anything about um, Asian Americans. And um, in fact, the, the organization that we raised money for in the, the first round, the Asian American Journalist Association, actually had a difficult time even being a part of that in the beginning of my career, because I just thought, I don't really fit in, you know, there's not a place for adoptees. And I feel so inadequate when people are talking about the way they were raised or the foods that they ate, because I didn't do any of that. Um, but I think the difference is, when we all walk outside and face the world, they don't know that your parents are white or they don't know that you're an immigrant or they don't know X, Y, and Z, they just see you. And so that's why, where I think we can definitely find common ground um, or common experience because um, especially with all the anti-Asian hate that we're seeing, you know, it's, people don't care what your background is, that nothing is gonna save you basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a real serious thing we have to think about, you know? Yeah, and I guess this this lays a good foundation for the premise of what we're going to talk about. It's like, man, this background is so unique, right? And <laughs> I want people to hear that that story side of you, where it's like you're leading a very Asian movement, right? <laughs> and I think you're more than qualified to lead this movement. That's I don't care what anyone else says, but I, I feel like you are. And I want more people to hear that story, right? Oh about, wow! Like, like accepting who you are because. You know, I had friends who are not adoptees by group in the Midwest, right? For example, that who kind of rejected their Asian heritage. They don't want to yeah. be Asian at all, right? Right. And the fact that you're blending two cultural identities, essentially, right? You're mm -hmm. like learning a lot about your culture, trying to embrace it. But look at you now. Like you, <laughs> you have a place, to, you have a place to call home, right? And <laughs> we're here for you. That's why I, want, oh I, I just want to say that, right? Say that up front. It's like you have a place now and you always had a place, right? I'm glad you're building this this house for other people who might feel the same way. Wow. And I want to talk a little bit more about like your early early parts of your journalism career, right? Because I would imagine, so I looked online, I read a couple articles about you. You did journalism for two decades. Mm -hmm. That's a, Still man. doing it. <laughs> oh man, hats off to you, right? Thank you for all the work that you do. And I'm kind of curious, like, what was it like breaking into the industry? Because I'm pretty sure, as you mentioned earlier, when people look at you, they see an Asian American woman. Right. right? Yeah, and yeah, obviously yeah. there's a lot of barriers against Asian American people and women in general, right? Mm -hmm. Women right. in general, but also Asian American men, yes. I think in journalism. Um, so we can go into that too, but yeah, I can't yeah. see men, but I can you know, be an ally for men. And I feel like we need to do so much more work uh, for men, for Asian American men in, yeah. in the industry. Let's dive, 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 dive into like the very parts of your career, right? And let's hear yeah. about like the challenges that you face. And I'm pretty sure that like, people stereotyped you a lot at the very beginning. And I want to hear like, how yeah. the industry has evolved throughout the years. And, you know, I mean, we can kind of get to the part where the whole very Asian movement kind of sprung up about. But I want to hear about like the early parts of your career and how you managed to navigate everything. Okay. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for asking that because it is, the funny thing is, you know, I started in 2002, so it really is 20 years. And I feel like a lot of those problems still exist today. And I'm sure that a lot of people of color have their own um, situations, no matter if they're Asian or not, um, that say, that would say, oh, those problems still exist for us. But I think that something that is really difficult is that in the beginning, people would say, you've got to change your name. You've got to change your name. It can't be what it is because it's too confusing and it's too distracting for the viewer. Um, so I didn't, I didn't because I actually fought against that for a long time. Um, but then eventually I was kind of tired of not getting work 
and feeling like news directors weren't looking at me. Um, so I changed my name. So Michelle Lee is a pen name, um, which I haven't hidden or anything like that. But um, but a lot of people just don't think of that. Like they know I'm an adoptee, but they, they don't ever go, well, why is your last name Lee? You know, um, and that's my Korean mother's name. But um, I took the L-I spelling because, you know, most Koreans, when they, you know, turn it into English, it becomes L-E-E. -E, or that's just the spelling they choose. I chose L-I because back then we used to have to send DVDs cold to news directors. So they would just get an envelope in the mail and they would see your name. And you'd, they'd, you'd have your you know, um, name on the DVD. So if I said Michelle Lee, L-I, people would automatically know. You're probably too young for this um, because I'm almost too young too, but like uh, there was a Michelle Lee actress um, in the 80s. You know who I'm talking about? She was on Dynasty. I, so, I think so. I'm actually not that young, okay. but thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I get that too. Like, you're probably really young. And I'm like, well, I'm <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, then I shouldn't say that. But, you know, but I just remember being like, well, I don't want to be Michelle, be mistaken for Michelle Lee, not Dynasty, you know? And um, my Korean uh, na family name is actually Park, but Park seems complicated to me because. Um, I had two friends in college whose last names were Park and they were white girls, you know? So I just thought like, what is the, um, what is the point of me having a name that no one's gonna recognize as Asian? So we did, we decided with Michelle Lee, but it felt like the death of me in so, in so many ways because I could never say my name again. You know, I could never say that like, um, that dig out is what we, we call it, you know, Michelle Sherwood, da, 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 da. it was always Michelle Lee. And I used to have to write it down in the prompter, like my actual name so that I wouldn't say the wrong name on air. Um, but aside from that, I know that's happened to my, to my other friends. And currently um, there's an article, if you Google Simni Kim, um, she's a friend of mine and she's in Seattle. She's at the, uh, she's at Cairo TV. And she wrote an article because when she moved to Seattle, the news director who was not Asian said, well, you've got to change your name to Simni Kim because no one can pronounce Chewin. Even though she had been Simni wow. Chewin for years. Wow. And so, so now insane. she, it's insane, right? And so now, you know, she's like, people always think I'm Korean when I'm really Cambodian, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's this idea of um, erasure for so many people, whether you're an adoptee and you're going from Sherwood to Lee, or you know, you, you're getting mistaken for Korean because your last name now is Kim on air. And that, um, I will say in all fairness, that happens to a lot of people not uh, Asian either. Like if you've got a, uh, I had a friend whose last name was uh, like Frank Bonner and they made him change it to Bonner, <laughs> you know, like, hey, so it's, it's, so, and that was just a white guy. And I have a, another good friend who's, name was Simonitis and they made her change it to Simon. So, um, but, but the idea that we have to change our names because we're, we have to fit into a role uh, is, is wrong. Um, and, you know, and the idea of like, uh, uh, it's really the people in power making the decision on how we fit into their puzzle piece in the newsroom. And other things too, like, um, sorry if I'm like, talking a lot we just no, no, uh no i'm just like I'm it's, all, it's like i have all these experiences that i'm like how many do you want to know we, we need you to talk about it more because i don't think a lot of people understand like what the process is and it still is to be honest yeah. like, it's still going on like no it's not no it, like no one's talking about it enough right? yeah, we need to I, hear these type of podcasts <laughs> well another thing too and this is i think still a thing even though people would say it's an unspoken thing but back in the day, so you know, 15, 20 years ago, people used to say, and not even probably 15 years, probably more like 10 years ago, people would say to me, oh, you can't work in, you can't work in Tulsa. There's already an Asian anchor there. Um, and that would just confuse the viewers. My agent said that, news directors have said that to me. And then my peers, because they already know, you know, like they knew how it was. Like, oh, you can't get, and especially if it wasn't a West Coast city, you know, if it was, on the West Coast, people would say, oh, go for it. I mean, I did have news directors who'd say, I think you'll have more success on the West Coast. But like, if you're from the Midwest, maybe you don't want to go to the, the coast, you know, or what do you, what do you mean we don't exist anywhere else but the West Coast? So it was really offensive in so many ways. Like, I think San Francisco is a good market for you, Michelle. Oh, that one city? 
no thanks. There are like 200 markets, you know. Um, so in a way, it was really hard uh, to navigate at the beginning. And I would say, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and this is going to be, I've never really said this out loud in public, but like I always wanted to work in Kansas City and St. Louis because that's, I grew up watching Kansas City News and I wanted to be close to my family and I could never get an interview anywhere. And I always wondered why, because there were people who were less um, qualified, I mean, I shouldn't say less qualified, less experienced. Um, and I really believe that it took me getting a job in Seattle, a top 15 market, before I could get considered to come back to Missouri. Um, because if even the conversation in, I don't I'm sure my news manager sir, would not like to hear that, but, um, but it's like, uh, even now the conversation in St. Louis is still like, well, St. Louis is a black and white city, but Asian people have been here forever. You know, Asian people, the, the thing that I think is really interesting about St. Louis is that we had a Chinatown that is a hundred years old. It literally was here from 1860 to 1960, or some maybe 1870 to 1960. Um, and people don't even know it existed here. How can you erase that kind of history when it's a century old? People have been here, but um, I think sometimes they think, well, if we're gonna really make an impact in our ratings and with our audience, we really need people who are gonna reflect what we think the demo is. And so, um, you know, Asian people, again, this is the same advice, you know, going to like, okay, this is how I could be successful in Seattle because it's a West Coast city with a, with a uh, diverse Asian population. And um, the, 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 the school district that we live in now has the same amount of um, like Asian population than the school district that I was in in Seattle. So it's, when you look at data and you look at numbers, that's, it's not true, you know, when people say, oh, well, you just don't exist here. So anyway, I, there was a long time when I just felt like I could not get a job in the Midwest because of, um, because people didn't believe that we existed here. That is, that is an insane story for me to hear, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the business, you know, if you're thinking like, okay, well, who's our audience? Is it, it's, a uh, they used to give us like descriptions of people. Yeah. So you could say like, oh, well, our, think about it this way. Um, our, our main viewer, our key viewer is 37 years old and her name is Susie and she lives in South County and she has two kids and, you know, it's stuff like that. Well, you don't think of yourself as Susie, you know, so you just, yeah. they never say like, oh, our, our key viewer is Hyun Sook and she lives, you know, in West County, no one ever says that, right? It's always yeah. this image of this um, white suburban mom, probably. Um, or at least that's been my experience in the in the time that I've been in news. Yeah. So I think that there is a reckoning, but I still think that like you have to have the right people in the right leadership positions to make the right hiring decisions and bring equity into the newsroom. That is very infuriating to hear in some ways, right? <laughs> it's like you have to fit in a certain mode, erasure. It's, I know, I know, like you mentioned earlier, it's not just the Asian community, it's like everyone who has to fit in a certain mode, right? Oh, yeah. And I guess the flaw of this, in my opinion, it's like the surveys itself. Like, how do you profile your, your targets, their yeah. audience, like correctly, right? And it's like, I know I, I we buy that service you know you pay for that service for someone to tell you who your key viewer is and and I should say I've still been working for 20 years and I have to thank people for like their um their encouragement and their support because yeah. really I've never had one single um I've never had one single Asian hiring manager. So someone has hired me all this time who wasn't Asian. So mm -hmm. I have to thank those people too, you know, yeah. but I, I definitely think um, it would be nice to at least have more people who come from a sense of, or a, a place of adversity yeah. or feel like they have permission to make decisions based on how they live, right? Absolutely. Because I think this goes back to like, um, not just race, but gender and all those things. Like so many yeah. women, when they get into leadership positions, because they've had to sacrifice so long, they end up, they end up kind of managing like they're not women, you know, like they didn't sacrifice so much for their kids to get to that position or something. And if we, there's a really great podcast that Michelle Obama did with Valerie Jarrett about women being able to 
um, lead as women and bring those unique experiences. If we all can bring our own unique experiences to the table, yeah. then um, then we do better. But if we're all kind of fitting into one role that we think, you know, that role looks like, then we're not doing ourselves a service. My my best, I wouldn't say. Well, I shouldn't say best because I don't want to like offend any other general managers. <laughs> but like the, uh, I would say one of the most empathetic general managers I had was a white guy, but he was also a gay dad. And, you know, so he had this experience of like, you know, raising a child, adopting a child, you know, being in a, in a, you know, for 20 years, like he, you know, wasn't married to his partner, you know, all these things that like you, when you come from a place of adversity, then you can lead with um, empathy. And so, um, so I felt, I always felt really supported by him. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm, so glad. I'm glad you're able to find people in the industry to like really help guide you along. Yeah. And man, like it, it's really awesome to hear like you shed light in so much part and nuances that you face, right? Because I want change to happen, right? And yeah. I'm hu- always been a huge, like, like always pushing for change to happen, right? I want, I'm the type of person that goes into every situation and like, guys, this is wrong. <laughs> and, yeah. and people don't like that right but I feel like you're also the same way and I kind of want to talk about like the very Asian movement right <laughs> and I know a lot of our listeners want to hear more about that and and for context um talk about the impact okay. and how do you leverage it for positive change okay well just you know got a viewer complaint basically on New Year's Day because I talked about dumplings um and she said that I was very Asian and that I needed to keep my Korean to myself and that if I if I would had been a white anchor talking about what white people ate, I would have been fired, and I was just very annoying. And so I just needed to talk about what white people ate. And then it was like, thank you, sorry, it was annoying, bye. <laughs> and so I shared that it went viral, um, and you know a lot of people are probably sick of hearing that story by now. But um, I'm not sick of it. Keep telling it. <laughs> Keep going, Michelle. <laughs> when when Ellen gave us the money, so I mean, granted, I literally just got that check last week um so it takes a while the cardboard checks do not pass but um we decided to make them to make something out of it and so you know everyone i had talked to said you've got to do a foundation if you're going to do anything it's got to be from the goodwill of people um and maybe that we can use that momentum to make some actionable changes and so i was like yeah hell yeah let's do that (laughs) and now i'm like oh my god it's so much work (laughs) but um but to me, it felt like it really, um, it made me realize how much work we've all been doing anyway to get to a point like this, you know, to have some sort of, I, want, I don't want to call it a gift horse, but it really was like this woman calling was a gift. The way it turned out was a gift because now it's like all the work that I didn't realize I was doing can lead me to a position to say, no, we're going to take this harness this, these good vibes and make it into something so that we can have lasting change for the next generation. Because my kid is a mixed race, you know, kiddo. And there, I mean, so many of us are looking for content that we can't even give to our own kids, let alone ourselves. Like for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, that ship has passed. You know, who needs to talk about, I don't need to do the work for myself on adoption. I mean, I do, but you know, I always think, I can come later, but my son can't, you know, he's, I want him to be, I want him to grow up feeling confident and proud of who he is and not ashamed of who he is, like how I felt, and you know, so often. So, oh my gosh, that's good. It's so hard because, you know, you think about when you have kids, you start thinking about like, you don't want to mess them up. You don't want them to spend their whole adulthood working on their childhood traumas because that's what I feel like I've done in so many ways so (laughs) I um yeah so so to me I'm very passionate about making this actionable change and I know that so many other great um, organizations and and groups and people are already doing that but um there was just so much great response um from people who felt like they could share a moment and take pride in who they are and they didn't even have to be Asian. I mean, there were so many people who were like in solidarity posting. So I just felt like, how can you not 
you'll never have another moment like that in your life, probably, right? Some people don't get a moment like that at all. Most of us don't. So why just disappear in two weeks? I mean, you might disappear from the headlines in two weeks, right? But like you could still make this foundation to make change. Sorry, I got emotional. <laughs> no, no, I, I felt that. And I'll give you lots of credit, right? Um, <laughs> because I, I realized that what people don't know is how much work goes into everything, everything that you do, right? And it may right. seem so seamless, like, oh, I'm just sharing, resharing stories, whatnot, but there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And the way the, that you were telling your story, it's like, I can tell that it's tied to a lot of your why, right? Yeah. So I, I can see how this movement is so powerful now. And, you know, a lot of it ties back into my own personal experience too. Um, two years ago, Asian Hustle Network went viral as well, telling Asian mm-hmm. stories, and to be honest, before that, I was just very absent-minded, uh, not absent-minded <laughs> engineer, where it's like, oh, I don't care <laughs> about my job, right? Yeah, right? And like everything you told me just now just brings up all these memories that I had of like wanting to build a feature and do it. I'm still building it, right? And just, I'm yeah. never going to give up. Like, it's going to happen, right? And it's still powerful because like I feel like if this had happened to anyone else, it will probably be gone in like a week or two. And I said, oh. I made my stance. I spoke up. I did this and that. All right. I did my part. Right. Yeah. But this all ties back into your why and the reason why you don't want it to just stop there. And it shows. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, that's good. Cause I still see your merch <laughs> everywhere, which I love. Very Asian. <laughs> Damn straight. We're very Asian. Keep it that way. Right. Yeah. And now, now you have like a foundation. You're, you're donating money to like, people causes that are important to you and important to the society and community and i don't know if i should talk about this but the conference too <laughs> you, know, you, you have that coming up it's like <laughs> dang like that's that's amazing and you know it doesn't because the way i see it is that most organization charity nonprofits, foundation whatever it is the heart and soul comes from the leader right and that's the one thing it's like you can tell a lot about a person's intentions by the way that they run their organization and the way that you run your movement. It tells me a lot about who you are as a person. I'm kind of curious too, from your point of view, it's like, at what moment have you felt like, dang, this is maybe this is getting too much for me. I can't handle it. <laughs> Every <Right>? morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I, okay. So just to give you, you know, some, it, it feels like we're building a plane in midair you know, because we weren't intending to, you know, I think if you were going to form a nonprofit, you would have some thought into it, right? Like you would think about like, oh, this is going to be my mission. And oh, this is going to, this is how we're going to do it. And you would have maybe a business plan or something. And really, you know, we all have day jobs and we're a lot, and three of us are parents of humans. One's a dog parent. And um, we're just like, wow, I don't, you know, we know what we want our mission to be, but then we want to be very clear in our mission for other people. So, and we all have different backgrounds, like technically, legally, I'm an immigrant, a naturalized citizen, an adoptee, and a mom of a mixed child, um, a mixed race child. Then, you know, like uh, Gia's family, like they're refugees, they're, you know, they have a totally different experience. Um, And so I feel like, you know, we are trying to figure out what our goal, what are all the goals that we align with, you know, and then how do we reach the people who we align with too, you know? So um, it's, it's interesting because I definitely think that we need to amplify diverse voices within our community, but how do we really support it? How do we bring about actionable change? And then how do we have our own programming so that we can reach really some of those people who might not feel seen. So th- that's not going to all fit in a mission statement. <laughs> so we've got to work on, you know, the clarity there. And so that's what we're working on now. Um, and it's like, you know, every morning I wake up, someone like our friend or, you know, our mutual acquaintance, Don, hey, I can do this very Asian conference. Hey, have you thought about putting merch in this store? Hey, these restaurants want to do this dumpling foundation or dumpling donation. Um, have you thought about the logo? What about the new website? What are we going to get in for new merch? Don't forget it's International Women's Month. And then don't forget it's the Atlanta shooting. Hey, can you do um, South by Southwest? I mean, it just goes 
on and on and on and on and on. And I am so grateful, but I'm also like, been my day job, you know, it's like, well, we need this ratings piece. And by tomorrow, who, what, sh what shoot are you going to do? Can you make these phone calls? Oh my gosh. It just, you know, it's hard. And then my little kid's like, mama, I want to play trains. <laughs> so it's like, um, every day I think, wow, okay, let's just breathe. What's the most urgent thing to do today? And we'll write it down in a list and we'll get to it. But there are so many things in my in all of our heads that we want to do now. Yeah. I think besides the kid part, everything else is relatable. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have to have kids pretty soon too, so I hope so. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, we um, can talk about that if you want. <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, everything you said is completely relatable. And it's like you're sitting on a fire hose. And yeah. The craziest thing is like you have to make split second decisions without really understanding the ramifications of the decisions you're making. Yes. I, it's a part of part of everything and i realized that having a lot of guests in our podcast uh we, yeah. we have had over like 150 200 episodes already um I, I realized that a lot of these successful entrepreneurs that we look up to and like are like multi-billionaires or whatever they do no one really knows what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> right and that's i just want to remind people on this podcast and yourself included that you know no one really knows what they're doing but the one thing they have in common is consistency and following the heart, right? Because when you have true yeah. alignment, it never feels like work. And you have true alignment, like knowing that you're putting your best foot, putting, putting your best work forward without screwing anyone with the intentions to make the community great. Like that is, that's probably the best North Star that you can follow, right? Yeah, yeah. So my, and that, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just to say that gives me so much more comfort, you know, because I, I always think like, a couple of things I think yeah no one knows what they're doing I mean that's very obvious like when you talk to people but when you hear in in podcasts you know and you talk to entrepreneurs like you do um you realize yeah people are just going going with it you know being able to be somewhat flexible um you know being able to pivot being able to you know still dream big and a lot of us don't dream big enough you know I had someone um, a mentor of mine who said, Michelle, you're not dreaming big enough. Like you, this is a moment that you should probably take the time to dream big, have a plan, but dream big. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in my forties. I've never been able to dream about anything. You know, I mean, you have these, I think it was in many ways a dream to be a journalist, you know, and to have this career and still be in it after all this time and all these transitions in the industry. Um, it was a dream to be a mom, you know, because we struggled with infertility for 10 years. And um, so, yes, so my dreams have come true in many ways, but this is a different kind of dream that I used to say, man, if I won the lottery, this is the kind of work I would do. And when you, when you take out the lottery, I guess it was the show, social media lottery, then it's like, wow, well, now the only thing that's holding you back is you. So, um, so then it's like, okay, well, let's just go for it. And if it fails, then you at least tried. Um, but I'm hoping that we don't fail. Of course, you know, I just hope we fail. give ourselves enough grace to, you know, to, to make, to be transparent, um, you know, in our, all of our actions and hoping that we don't make any missteps that are, um, you know, that you can't recover from. I'm hoping we don't make any missteps at all, but I know that's not reality, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. so that's a, that's a tough part yeah it is it is uh i can totally see us like in the same position before and <laughs> honestly like everything you mentioned and i know most entrepreneurs too listen to this podcast right now it's like they probably feel the same way right and i really like yeah. the re relatability standpoint that you bring to the table it's like we want to do a lot of things right that's that's the reality but we're always confined with like the time constraint or commitments that we currently have, right? All yeah. of us have 24 hours of the day. And that's the one thing that I always looked into when I was like, I'm like, oh my God, I can't breathe today. Like there's so many things going on, right? And yeah. it's like, how do these successful people like partner malize and manage their time? And the one thing I found is like, there's a certain amount of focus, right? Like it's better to, to do one or two things really well to benefit the community in that sense and try to do everything. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, your position right now, the world sees you as a superhero, right? And and as a superhero, you're sort of 
you know, fall into the comic book Marvel stuff as like this person that can solve everyone's problems. But at the end of the day, you're still human, right? And mm-hmm. the end of the day, you're still Michelle. You have a lot of other commitments. But now it's up to you to decide like what are the most important ones that I can focus on where it doesn't feel like work to me. Yeah. And the biggest advice I have is like, if something starts feeling like work and you start hating it, that means you're no longer aligned, right? Yeah. When you're no longer aligned, you won't do great work. You don't do great work and over time, the culture and the mission erodes, right? So it's all about like finding one or two things to do really well and finding yeah. things that fit with who Michelle is. And when you explain your why earlier, it's it's very clear that this is something that you want to do, right? But when yeah. you dive deep into your why, it's also very clear that there's certain things you want to do with this organization. Mm-hmm. And it's best to like take that very Asian movement and position it that way because at the end of the day, Michelle is the face, Michelle is the heart, Michelle is the soul of the organization. <laughs> Can you be my brand strategist? <laughs> my agent? I don't know, my, uh, my life coach? <laughs> no, I'm here to interview your story because yeah. it's remarkable to me, right? And I've, I've been looking at your IG and story for since, since the beginning of like everything happened and I'm just like, we need Michelle on the podcast. And Oh my gosh, well, thank you. I want to hear more about it. So it's like everything you talked about just now, it's like, it's a normal process, right? It's going to remind you and listeners and early entrepreneurs who are seizing the opportunity to not let go and not give up, right? Because over time, like with the, with the, the way the world universe works is that you attract the right people. And as long as you don't quit, give up, because there's a lot of times where you're just like laying in the sofa, you're like, why am I doing all this? Like, what, all right. What's the point? And, you know, the point is to like benefit the community and push things forward. Yes. To me, um, all these things that happened to us in our childhood, right? So to me, like when I think about the Variation Foundation, I think of like kids, you know, I think about yeah. like, how do we, I mean, other than the work that we're doing right now, but like also there just is so much, I think missing in terms of getting our kids to be really confident and proud, you know, exactly. and, and then we grow up to be proud adults, you know, and, and yeah. we just have a better leg up in the world. Um, but also we have so much to do on ourselves because of our childhoods, you know, yeah. because we, um, you know, people, you know, I remember when I was in school, I remember some some kids threw money at me and they, you know, said $5 sucky sucky, like all this stuff. Oh my God. And I told them to F off. It was horrible. Right. And I told them to F off. Um, and I got sent to the principal's office because of it. I was so mad. And I, um, doesn't anyone care that they called me, they did this to me. And my principal at the time, this is in the nineties, you know, was like, no, we don't care because you shouldn't have said the F word, (laughs) you know? And so, so that's like, I feel like in many ways that has been my whole existence um, yeah. dealing with people who were like, well, you shouldn't have lashed out that way. Yeah. Not, not to admit, but that wasn't the nucleus of it, you know? So then you, you have this childhood where you, you don't understand like why you were hypersexualized at a certain age. Cause you didn't even, yeah. even understand what that was. You know, I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. And then now that I'm raising a son, I want him to be, you know, not emasculated. I want him to grow up and feel like I can do anything I want to do and I can be proud of who I am. And I feel like so many Asian girls and boys are picked apart at such a young age. And then they have to, um, they have to, you know, figure that out when they get older. So it's just, it's hard, you know, and, and then adoptees have their own separate issues, you know, like so many of my friends um, who are adopted haven't even started looking at their haven't really been interested, you know, and started maybe in their 20s or 30s looking at culture a lot differently, or maybe they look at it differently when they start having kids. Everything, if you're thinking about having kids, everything changes. Everyone says this, but it really does change when you have your own kids um, or you start raising kids because it's like you don't want them, you want them to be better versions of yourselves and you want them to have, have the, you know, have the world. You want them to be able to have the same things that other kids have. So Absolutely um, agree. it motivates me every day yeah. <laughs> to think about my son. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm just going to ask the final question and you okay. go from there. What is, what is your vision for Very Asian? What do you hope to accomplish with this organization in the next 
six months, one year. Oh, in the next six months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the next six months, I would like to have some strategic planning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's funny that you use the word hub because we've used that word a lot too. Um, we would really like to be a place for resources. Um, and we would also like to be able to kind of help, um, help people get to where they need to be, right? So if you, and I'm not talking about like in your world, but like entrepreneurship, I mean, we could, we could definitely help support creators and makers and all those things. But it's like really this exploration of who you are and being able to um, express yourself be confident for the way you exist in the world as you are at this moment kind of thing. So how do we support that? We can support that through like even the Asian American Journalists Association because they do storytelling. They support storytellers. Um, journalism, journalists like to call themselves storytellers actually, but I always um, felt like that, that some people don't understand what that really means for journalists um, because they might, because I think of a storyteller as someone who like, tells a lot of stories, like not necessarily like uh, someone who tells the truth, but, um, but journalists like to be storytellers because people always remember how they feel when they hear a story. They don't remember the details necessarily of the story. So journalism is really important to me. AAJA is really important to me because when there are bad headlines or when Asian women are hypersexualized as they were in the shootings in Atlanta, um, AHAA can come out and say, listen, we've done this work. These are the words that you need to use. These are the words you need to avoid. These are the headlines that should not exist. And so that's important work that we can all benefit from. Um, right now we're doing a fundraiser for Stop AAPI Hate because I feel like if you, you can't have anything without safety, right? And um, the really great things about Stop AAPI Hate are not only are they collecting data, but they're also trying to make actionable change through language access and um, and helping you know support our youth. So right now it's really about raising money for causes that are already doing great things, but eventually it's about our own programming. And so what does that look like? Where can we fit? Where can we uh, fit in this space and do the best work? I really think preserving history is super important and it does support journalism in many ways because journalism is also the you know the first record of history so um, um, to me i think it's important to i don't want to be political but i do think it's important to preserve history in the sense that people know that asian american history is american history and so that when we have a one yeah and so that when we have a 100 year old chinatown in st louis that no one knows about then maybe we need to learn our history a little bit better um, because if it's in St. Louis, it's in Cincinnati, it's in, you know, it's in Seattle, it's in Tacoma, it's in wherever, it's in a lot of the different places. Yeah, so I think of, you know, to me, I, even though I do want to, you know, um, there are a lot of things that I want to do, but I really think that it's important to me to get some sort of results, um, some sort of actionable change. And you know, we have to pick kind of our battles, right? To see which ones align, not only with the foundation, but allow us to keep our day jobs <laughs> as, mm -hmm. as journalists. Um, you know, a lot of times we are about uncovering wrongs, you know, righting wrongs as journalists. And so to me, if, if it's in my opinion, I think it's um, important to right these wrongs, to uncover history and to share it and preserve it and educate people. Because when you know something existed, and you know something happened, then you can hopefully come from a place where it won't happen again, you know, yeah. where you will be able to do better in the future and do better for future generations. And um, it's just like everything. Kids now are so much more empathetic and more intelligent than we were because they know more. So that's what I, I really believe in, in making actionable change, um, starting from the community, from the communities in which we live, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that if you can make one change in one community, then you can scale it. And that's what I would really like to see. Yeah, I love that. And damn, I I know damn's not the right word, but <laughs> dang, like it's it's a great mission. And I'm so excited to like see what's next for you guys. And and Michelle, how can our listeners find out more about you and reach out to you? Well, I think the easiest way right now is just through social media. Um, we do have a website, but we're actually going to go through a redesign 
Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't really know what to say other than social media is probably the easiest because uh, we're the Variation Foundation or I'm Michelle Lee Peek. Awesome. I'll leave all that in the show notes. But Michelle, thank you so much on being on the podcast today. We really appreciate that. Thank you for your interest. I'm, I'm stunned and shocked and humbled, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Michelle.